Well, good morning. Welcome to Park Street Baptist Church. If you're a visitor, I offer you a particularly warm welcome. My name's Terry, and you are more than welcome to join this Park Street online service. I'm at church. Isn't it nice to see this again, the cross? I just thought I'd walk you through some of the changes. Look, microphone, already some changes. It looks a bit different. We're going to have a little walk. You come over here. You can see all oh, sound equipment. It's been painted. Look, look at paint. Lovely paint. What's this? A new carpet. There is lots of changes going around in this church. Lovely liquor paint. Brilliant. New radiator over there. Fat. Brilliant. Whoop. See if I get it right again. If you go out to the car park, you can see there's new uh, tarmac out there. The toilets have been done up. There's new flooring. A lot has been happening at this church. Why am I talking about this? Well, change is good. And so simple, a touch of paint makes it look so much nicer. Well, my message this morning comes from Ezekiel 36, verse 26. And God placed this on my heart. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 says this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will move from you a heart of stone and I will give you a heart of the flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So this morning I just want to ask you lovingly, how is your relationship with God? Over lockdown, have you gone after him? Have you allowed God to shape you? Have you allowed his spirit, Jesus, to come inside, to shape you, to mould you? Well, this morning I felt God had something on my heart from this passage. And what he's talking about here is what happens as followers of Jesus. If we put our trust in him, he will give us a new heart. But it goes on and says, not only will he give, give us a new heart, but he'll get rid of any bitterness, the heart of stone, any bitterness, any anger, he will remove from you and give you a fresh heart. I don't know if you, some of us may have had a rough past, someone have may have wronged us, we may have overcome things and we've become angry and bitter. Certainly over lockdown you've had more time to think and some things may have crept up and you find yourself becoming more angry, more irritable and you don't know how to get rid of this. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, God can give you a new heart. Turn to God. Allow him to change you, to shape you, to mould you. He will give you a new heart. And if there's any bitterness in our lives or anger, we need to turn to God, to look to Jesus. Not in a disappointed, in a shameful way, because it's very easy to think like that. But Jesus, looks at you and me and he loves you and wants to give you a new heart he's not disappointed in you whatever that bitterness however small you may think it is however big you may think it is jesus christ wants to give you his spirit wants to give you a new heart so that's my message for this morning let's pray heavenly father i thank you for Jesus. I pray that we would look to you for guidance, for wisdom and support. I pray we would confess all the bitterness and anger that we may have, all the wrongs that were committed to us, we, any struggles that we're having in our lives, we would just commit them to you. Any burdens, we'd cast our cares and burdens onto you and allow your spirit to change our hearts. And I pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, our first song, Praise the Name, then we're going to sing Waymaker.
morning. It's good to be with you again. Um, those of you that recognize me will remember that I preached last at Pastry Baptist Church in October last year when we did not envisage at all what is happening at the moment with our lockdown. But those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Peter, as I said, and uh, I'm a member of a local church in St. Albans, Ridgeway Church, and we meet um, when we are able to meet at Sandringham School. And uh, I can certainly say that I bring you at Park Street Baptist Church our greetings. We do pray for you. We pray the Lord would bless us at these extraordinary times. And we just thank the Lord that even in this situation, we can know the power of his word. And as we meet together around his word, that he can continue to speak to us through it. This morning, we're going to be looking at Psalm 46. And I'd like to read that for you before we start. But before we do that, let me just pray that the Lord would lead us and uh, help us in our understanding. Our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that in all circumstances, we can know that you are with us. We can share the experience of those who, when this psalm was first written, knew such extreme danger. Lord, we, though in a different situation, can simply say with the same authority, with the same desire, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And so we pray that you'd lead us now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Psalm 46 then. And I'll be reading from the NIV. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I don't know about you, but the Psalms are, for me, at least... Uh, part of the book, part of the Bible that I turn to when I need strengthening and comfort, maybe encouragement. David, when he was hiding from his enemies, often wrote psalms, psalms which spoke of the difficulties and the crises he faced, but also of his reliance upon God. Maybe we're experiencing uh, times of blessing and we need to be reminded of where we're going and what is the direction of our travel. And the Psalms of a sense often speak to us in that way, men and women, boys and girls who travelled up to Jerusalem to celebrate a festival would often sing the Psalms of a sense together, recounting God's blessing upon them. Maybe for some, the Psalms are a source of praise in times of joy, hymns which remind us of our salvation. Can you think of a few? Psalm 103 is certainly one of them where it speaks of God and his, the wonderful forgiveness we have in him. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. Maybe a time of encouragement when life is hard and the Psalms remind us of our dependence upon our creator. Or maybe, as we see in Psalm 51, a psalm of repentance, when we've sinned and we know we've, we've disobeyed God and we need to turn back to him in repentance and faith. And using the words of a psalm often speaks into our own hearts and speaks of the longing that we have 
to be <clears throat> to be with God and to know his peace. There are times when we need to remind ourselves of God's care for us and of his sovereignty in creation. And Psalm 46 is such a psalm. Now, I don't know whether you've got the Bible in front of you. It's probably a good idea if you do, because I'd just like to point out a little bit of the structure of Psalm 46 before we look uh, at a bit more of the detail. Because it seems to me that psalm, that psalm has three verses in it and a chorus which is sung twice. Verse 1 will be our verses 1 to 3. And verse 2 will be our verses 4 to 6. And then there's verse 7, which is the chorus. And then there's verse 3, which is our verse, verses 8 to 10. And then finally verse 11, the chorus. And the chorus, it seems to me, summarise the whole psalm. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Sung twice to assure us of who God is and what he's done for us. And those three verses, really in many ways, are the three points of the psalm. The verse 1, which is our verses 1 to 3, is God is with us, so we will not fear. And in the second verse, 4 to 6, God is within us, so we will be sustained. And then the final verse, God is powerful, and he will be exalted. So then the, the first verse, verses 1 to 3. God is with us, so we will not fear. The picture here in the psalm is one of catastrophe. Uh, something amazing is happening because foundations that should be immovable give way. Mountains that should be permanent are moved. Not just a small distance, but to the heart of the sea. And the waters around us are not peaceful. They roar and foam. The great immovable mountains tremble. The scene is one of uncertainty. Everything that we could rely upon now seems like quicksand. Uh, things disappear uh, when, when they stand on the quicksand. And it seems that all the foundations that we trust in are like that. What we thought was immovable now seems like the shifting sand just easily moved. But in the midst of that, the psalmist can say the most extraordinary words. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Why does he have that confidence? And where does his confidence come from? Well, I think the psalmist gives us two reasons, and they come in, this, in verses 2 and 3. The, the two reasons are this. One, who God is. And two, what he has done for us. And we'll see those in just a moment. The image of mountains and their apparent strength, which we have in the psalm, um, which, which says... Therefore, uh, the mountains are moved into the heart of the sea, and the waters roar and foam. Mountains, which seem substantial, in fact, are just pinnacles of land reaching out from the vast deeps of the ocean. They're just bits of land that stick out above the vast deeps of the oceans, which we don't know much about, are largely unexplored. Did you know that the, the oceans are deeper than the mountains are high? What I mean is this. Everest is 8,800 metres high. But the deepest part of the ocean is 11,000 metres deep. It could easily bury the entire Mount uh, Everest above sea level in its depths. In fact, the volume of the oceans is about ten times the volume of land above sea level. The oceans are enormous and are, and are far bigger and make, make the mountains look insignificant beside them. In many ways, that picture is for us. Do we put our confidence in God or do we trust in our own strength? 
David said in Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, that is the horses and the chariots, but we rise and stand upright. Psalm 46 is probably written in Hezekiah's time, the time of King Hezekiah, and the incident it probably refers to you can find in two kings, chapters 18 and 19, or in Isaiah, chapters 36 and 37. Assyria, a vast army invading a tiny kingdom. And there they were on the gates of Jerusalem, taunting not only the people of Israel, but taunting God. And they said of the people of Israel, well, if you've got 2,000 men spare and can ride horses, well, we've got 2,000 horses spare that we don't need to use. You can ride them. Such was their resources, such was the vastness of the army that Israel looked puny in comparison. Well, the odds, they were hopeless. Defeat was certain. But that's been the lot of God's people time after time in history. You only have to turn back to the beginning of the Bible in the Old Testament. In Exodus, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, God rescued them from slavery. There they were defenceless, and yet God, in his, with a powerful arm, took them out of Egypt and on to the Promised Land. Then, many years later, when they disobeyed God and God allowed them to be captured and taken into captivity, there he rescued them and brought them back to the, 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 the nation, to the land of Israel. And in exile itself, there was Esther. You remember the story of Esther? There, God rescued them from defeat and destruction. In the New Testament, we have a similar occurrence when the uh, Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. And the prophecy said, when you see these, uh, the army gathering, leave Jerusalem. Don't stay back. Don't go and collect your goods. Run for the hills. But you know, in Bible times, there were few more potent symbols of defeat and destruction than the cross itself, than the cross on which Jesus died, a symbol of defeat and destruction. You only have to recall a short time ago when another regime in Iraq, ISIS, uh, do you remember them? They used crucifixion to humiliate their defeated enemies. In Hezekiah's time, God in his grace and mercy rescued the people of Israel and they could sing with joy that verse 1, God is our refuge and strength. In Esther's time, there was rescue and uh, although God's name is not mentioned in that book, clearly God is at work through Mordecai, through Esther, to preserve his people in a foreign land. In the exile, there was rescue, and the people returned to the land. At the cross, there was no rescue for Jesus. There was no rescue to deliver him from public humiliation. He suffered and died alone, forsaken by his disciples, forsaken by his father, taunted by his enemies. In Psalm 46, the people of Israel rejoice because God came to their rescue. At the cross, the opposite happened. Jesus facing his enemies. He did that to become our rescuer. The person on the cross whom we would look on as needing rescue was in fact the one who was bringing us our rescue. Jesus, when he was on the cross, he was deserted by his father. The father turned his, father, uh, his face away and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus did that for us so that we would never have to say those words. But Jesus cried out, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you know, at the cross, there was irony. Was Jesus defeated? Was Satan triumphant at the cross? Well, the answer to that is a resounding no. No, Jesus was not defeated and Satan was not triumphant. Three days after Good Friday, there was the day of resurrection. Jesus rose again from the dead. What happened at the cross? Well, Paul summarized it in this way, writing to the Colossians. He said, at the cross, he, that is Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The cross looked like a defeat, but there all the powers of Satan were defeated. How ironic then is it that Satan, there gloating at the cross, gloated at his own defeat. The believers, the early believers, meeting in Jerusalem soon after Jesus had died and rose again and had returned to glory. In praying, they said these words, There at the cross, Herod Pontius Pilate, along with all the Gentiles and the people of Israel, did what God had planned and predestined. Again, there's the irony, isn't it? They were complicit in their own defeat. Do you remember Simeon and Anna in the temple when Jesus was brought to the temple to be uh, dedicated? When they held the baby of Jesus in their arms, could they have imagined the defeat, the shame, the humiliation of the cross that would be the experience of this little baby? No, they couldn't. But we can look back and see that Jesus did that for us, for all God's people, everywhere and for all time. He is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Words of triumph because of the cross. He is our hiding place, as, G as David said in Psalm 32. He is our hiding place because of the cross. Jesus suffered and died so that we would never have to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our lot, our portion, the words that we can use are these. God is my refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Well, that's the first one. God is with us. But the second verse says this. God is within us. We will be sustained. God is within us. We will be sustained. Here are the words that the psalmist wrote. There is a city whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. Think of any capital city. Just take a moment and think of one. Just one. Have you got a capital city? I wonder which one you thought of. Well, before you <coughs> verbally answer that question to the people around you, answer this question. Can you name the river that flows through it? Can you name the river that flows through the capital city that you thought of? If you chose London, well, that's easy, isn't it? The Thames is the, is the big river that throw, flows through London. There are many, many other smaller rivers, but the Thames is the river that we always say is the river where London is built. If you thought of Paris, of course, the Seine is the river there. Or if you thought of Cairo, the Nile. Or Baghdad, the Tigris. Or Washington, Potomac. Or Berlin, the Spree. Some rivers have more than one capital city on its banks. Can you name one river that does that has that? Well, there is one river in Europe at least, and it's the River Danube. 
You know, if you know anything of the topography of Palestine, you'll know this one fact. The city of God, Jerusalem, has no river. There is no river in Jerusalem. It isn't sitting on a big, great water supply that most capital cities sit on. Of course, that presents a weakness to any city, and any invading army will exploit it. You may, you will know that David used the well that supplied Jerusalem with its water to capture the city. Hezekiah built a tunnel to the well to ensure the water supply uh, for Jerusalem, so that the city will be safe in the face of the Assyrians. Water is precious, and without it we die. Here in this city of God, however, there is a river. There is a river, as the psalmist says, whose streams make glad the city of God. It's no ordinary river. You see, usually streams flow into the river. And the river itself is referred to as the place where water is supplied. But here, streams seem to flow from the river. And it is the streams flowing from that river that make glad the city of God. Where, do, where does that or those streams come from? What is its source? Well, it's God. He is in the midst of her, and the streams that flow from him make glad the city of God. I wonder, does that remind you of anything that Jesus said? Well, if it does, it may well be the, this verse in John chapter 4, where Jesus, speaking to a Samaritan woman, he said to her, when she was drawing water from a well, everyone who drinks water from this well, where you're drawing this water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This river makes glad the city of God. This river is the Holy Spirit who dwells in the hearts of all believers. I wonder, does this living water that Jesus talks about sustain you and me? Does this Holy Spirit that clearly this water represents, does this Holy Spirit dwell in your heart? He dwells in mine. Paul writing to the Ephesians says this, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Psalm 46 speaks of God sustaining his people, sustaining them with living water, with the indwelling spirit of God. Wonderful, isn't it, to see there in the Old Testament a reference that clearly speaks to us of the life-giving water that comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit. As I said a moment ago, verse 7 is a reminder of the theme of the psalm. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The psalmist reminds us of two facts about God. Two facts. The first one is this, the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. He is sovereign over everything. And the second one is this, the God of Jacob. The God of Jacob. Speaking of the covenant he established with his people. The people of God refer to there in the name of God. The God of Jacob. But you know there's more. You see the Lord of hosts, the creator of all things, is with us. What an amazing assurance this is. When the whole world around us is shaken, God who made it is with his people. But the other one is the God of Jacob is our fortress. He is the only one to whom we can run. The mountains, well, they'll be moved. The waters, well, they roar and foam. 
Only God is immovable. But you know, I think the psalmist chose his words to remind us of one more thing. You see, he refers to God as the God of Jacob. The God of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the three patriarchs. Abraham, the father of many nations. Isaac, the one who laughs. And Jacob. Jacob? The one who grasps the heel, the deceiver. What a name. What a name. The one who deceives. So in the very name that God refers to us with, Jacob tells us what we're like. We are really like that. The deceiver, like Jacob. The one who grasps the heel, the one who wants what is not his. That's us. And despite that, God cares for us. He sent his only son to take our sin on himself at the cross so that we might be forgiven. But a third point, and it's this, in the third verse. God is powerful and he will be exalted. Did you see the film Darkest Hour? If you did, you'll know like me it's a, a brilliant film. Britain was facing defeat. Europe had fallen. One of the most evil men who had ever lived was poised to invade Britain. He had invaded the rest of Europe and subdued most of Europe. Defeat for Britain was not only on the cards. It looked a near certainty. But of course, you know the end of that story. God was merciful. God heard the prayers of the people of this nation, and the nation was saved. In the same way, Hezekiah was facing certain defeat. The odds were stacked against Israel. They were facing overwhelming odds. There was no way out. But God rescued them. I wonder, did those believers who were there at the cross, watching on when Jesus was, was crucified, think of this psalm? God rescued Hezekiah and the people of Israel. Will he step in to rescue Jesus? Jesus, the one who's innocent of all the accusations that were laid before us. Be still and know that I am God. That's what Hezekiah and the people heard. God will break the weapons of the enemies. He will bring salvation. In Exodus 14, on the banks of the Red Sea, the Lord told the children of Israel something very similar. Fear not, he said. Stand firm. Just be silent. The enemy might be just behind you. There might be a sea in front of you. But I will rescue you from the Egyptians. Surely, if there was ever an application to the cross, it is this. Be still. Do not fear. Satan might look as though he is triumphant, but his defeat is imminent. Satan might look as though he's just on the verge of getting everything. But be still and know that I am God. Do you remember the hymn that Stuart Townend wrote? The one that places us in the crowd at the crucifixion. It goes like this, how deep. The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. What looked like defeat at the cross was in fact God's greatest triumph. If Jesus had called upon the legions of angels to rescue him, the earth would have melted. The seas, the, the mountains would have been cast into the depths of the sea. And us? Well, we would have remained in our sins and under judgment. How thankful and grateful we should be that Jesus did not call for rescue, but accepted our judgment. He accepted our punishment. He accepted it so that when we cry out in repentance and faith, God the Father 
will hear us and bring us into the family of God. Jesus, earlier in the Gospel of John, said this, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Let's give praise to him that he was indeed lifted on the cross and that he does draw all men to him. The psalmist said in verse 10, Psalm 46 verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Where is God's exaltation seen in all its glory? In all its glory, it is seen at the cross. There, Satan was defeated once and for all. There, our sin was dealt with once and for all. There, the only perfect sacrifice was made once and for all time. Jesus is the one who is exalted. His name is above every name, and at his name every knee shall bow. Those probably remind you of the words that Paul wrote, and I'll, I'll end with these words. Paul wrote these words to the Philippians, to a young church that was experiencing opposition in, in many ways not too dissimilar to the opposition that Hezekiah faced, opposition that took them to jail, took them to punishment, and some to martyrdom. Paul said this to them, who, this is Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you that at this time we, we can acknowledge that you are exalted because Jesus died. You are exalted and we can see his exaltation in his resurrection and ascension. And so we come before you now to the one who sits at the right hand of the throne of God and we bring our petitions to you. Lord, we know that some will be facing difficulties because of the environment we're in through COVID-19. Lord, help us, we pray. Sustain us. Might we know your presence within us. And we pray that what we've thought about this morning in Psalm 46 might be an encouragement to us to continue to walk faithfully. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good being with you. I look forward to seeing you at some point again when things ease up. But for now, may I wish you God's blessing upon you and his peace to remain with you. Amen.